The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good evening to all of you. Uh, It has been such a sweet season to bring this message to you. A good good Friday, what began with the early church fathers and has continued what was known as the God Friday and has become the Good Friday, because of the goodness of God. It's been a a dear season for me. The last two weeks, as I've been reading and studying, meditating upon this passage in Isaiah 53, looking at the servant of the Lord, um, my aim for tonight is, is that God would press the person of Isaiah 53 on our hearts, and as he has been pressed on my heart in the last two weeks in a very, very precious and a very endearing way. Every morning I've been getting up, and I've been in Jeremiah, so I get up to judgment, and now I'm in lamentation, and so this has been so, so appropriate for, for me and my own heart and my own soul. Um, by, a, by a way of introduction, we have two books, so if you have your Bibles with you, Isaiah 53, and then also I'm going to look at John 19 for us. Um, there is a scene, there is a scene in John 19, verses 1 through 5, where Jesus, having been betrayed, arrested, denied, having been led from one trial to another, has been scourged and beaten, slapped and mocked in a very, very decisive moment. Pilate brings Christ out and parades him to the crowd. And in John 19, verse 5, it says this, Jesus then came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, and here's our phrase for tonight, Behold the man. There are Italian and Spaniard masterpieces, painting, if you will, that have captured this very moment called the Eke Homo, Behold the man. I'm not so sure if Pilate had any idea what he was saying or what he was doing, but certainly God the Father did. 700 years before that moment, God the Father, in Isaiah 52, if you would turn there with me, Isaiah 52, starting in verse 13, is where really our our passage starts. God is speaking, and here the Father says, the Lord, behold Not the man, but behold, my servant will prosper. He will bring high and lift it up. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than any son of men. Thus he will sprinkle or shock many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, for what had not been told them, they will see, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand. God the Father, the Lord here, will personally open and close this prophecy of Isaiah 53. A prophecy of an exalted, suffering servant. If there is any theme we could take, any theme we could take tonight is this, the suffering, the abed, the suffering servant. It is the most crystal, clear, prophetic prediction. 700 years before the coming of Christ. Somebody said it is so clear, it must have been written underneath the cross. It's so clear. So, This evening, I want us from the Old Testament to really, on this Good Friday, to meditate on the person and the work of Christ. So let's read it together. Isaiah 53, let me read read it for us. Who has believed our message? 
And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us had turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shear. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor were there, was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge, the righteous one. My servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many, and interceded for the transgression. This chapter towers above any chapter in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it's been rightly called the book of Romans of the Old Testament. It is an amazing chapter. This portion begins in 52... 13 and ends in 53:12. It begins with the exaltation of the servant of the Lord, and it dives deep in an awful humiliation and death, and he comes out on highly lifted up and greatly exalted. Nowhere in the prophecy does the servant ever speak. It is the story of a victim yet a victor. It is a story of tragedy, yet triumph. So let me pray for us tonight. And here's my request. Father God, would you please, would you please press, press on our hearts your servant, your abed. Father, may we love, we, may we love Christ. May we adore him for what he had done, for who he is, and what he means to you and to us. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Nowhere in the Old Testament does the gospel of Jesus Christ shine more clearly than in the book of Isaiah, especially in Isaiah 53. It is, it's been called the epicenter of the gospel it is the grandest, more dearly beloved passage of sacred lining, writing. So the storyline for us tonight is this. The power of God has been revealed in and through his submissive, humble servant who suffers to redeem sinners and rebels from their sins and guilt 
and who will rise and will be rewarded for his suffering. That's Isaiah 53. It is a prophecy of the future and for the future, yet all the tenses, most of the tenses here are looking back, are looking back as of someday Israel and the Gentiles will look back and they will mourn on him they, whom they have pierced. So when the Lord speaks and says, Behold my servant, six questions I want to ask, and we will work our way quickly through those. Six questions we will ask of this text. It is, it is the life story of the Messiah from the cradle to the grave and to glory. So there, it is a glorious story, and so our passage begins with a question. Look at verse 1. Who, literally, the, 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 the writer is saying, who would believe this? Verse 1, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is scarcely, hardly anybody, the very few. From the cradle to the grave, humble beginnings through a submissive life to a suffering and to the cross, the servant, the arm of the Lord has been revealed. The very power of God. The Israel rejected the Messiah. They were looking for Ben David, son of David, yet the Ben Joseph, son of Joseph, came to them. And they had their theology of the Messiah was a theology of glory and not the theology of suffering. Verse 8, even to his generation, who would even consider? No one was looking. No one was looking. The very few. No one was considering. At the heart of the cross was the arm of God revealing himself. And they went stumbling over it. Stumbling over it. One man put, put it this way, he says, God's power is, is at its greatest height, not in the destruction of the wicked, but in his taking the wickedness of man into himself and giving back unmerited love, unmerited grace. That was the, that's the power of God at its height. 700 years later, Paul would pen this in 1 Corinthians 118, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the Jews looked at it and said, weakness, weakness. And the Greeks and the Westerners and the Europeans looked at it and said, ah, it's foolishness. This is foolishness. And God is looking at it and saying, my servant, that is the arm of the Lord. So who was he? Second question, who was he? Who was he and what was he like? Verse 2, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of a parched ground. When it came to the time and to the place of his childhood, it was obscure time. There had been no word from God, 400 years of silence, no prophets, no prophecies from God. There was a spiritual silence, if you will. It was a spiritual dryness. Israel was in a state of spiritual apostasy. The idea of a dry ground and a dry parched place, unattended, unplowed, unwatered. Nothing, nothing was springing up. Like a tender shoot out of the root, like a twig, comes this Messiah. Unnoticed, unexpected, he comes onto the scene very, in a very unassuming way. As a kid, as a lad growing up on a, I almost put on the streets of Nazareth, but there were no streets at the time. But on the playground of Nazareth, Nazareth. It's like modern-day Tijuana. He grew up in the middle of nowhere, in an obscure town. Pilate, mocking the Jews, said, Behold, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. To be a Nazarene was nothing. It was a shame. And it says, Yet, 
Yet, for he grew up before him, before the Father. The suffering servant was the beloved of the Father. He was always before the eyes of the Father. He grew up in the Father's care and love. So another question to ask is, what did he even look like? That Isaiah really answers for us. What did he look like? Verse 2, he has no stately form or majesty, what we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. There is nothing in rank or position, in wealth and power, no outward pump, no grandeur, nothing that appeals, nothing that turns the face. No majesty, no height, no, no, no the grandeur of Saul, King Saul, the beauty of David wasn't there. Wasn't there. Yet, from an obscure birth, obscure family, birthplace, unimpressive appearance, was the very arm of God. Verses 3 and 4 answers our third question. How they reacted to him. How did they react? He came to his own and his own received him not. Look at verse 3 and 4. He was despised and forsaken of men, and like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, we did not esteem him. This wasn't just on the hours on the cross. This was through his life. Brought through his life and his ministry, his own brothers didn't care for him. Called a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Not only did he enter our sorrows and pains and emotions and, 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 and spiritual and physical, mental, he allowed our sorrows to enter God, to enter him, the God-man. Thus the man of sorrow. I want you to notice in our text the personal pronouns and even the possessive pronouns. It's a it, it begins as a confession and it escalates. Verse 2, we didn't look upon him. We weren't attracted to him. Verse 3, we, we despised him enough to turn and hide our faces from him. We, we didn't esteem him. By the time he made it on the cross, if he had any form of any beauty, it was beaten out of him. In appearance, even the Father says, he was marred. He was marred. Not only was he despised and forsaken, men hid their faces from him. It got worse. Look at verse 4. Yet we ourselves, it's like a double indictment. We, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Modern day translation to that verse is, we judged him. We judged him as being judged by God for his sins and for his blasphemies. They thought they were doing God's work by crucifying him. Total case of mistaken identity of the first order. The verbs and the adjective in this passage. He was despised, forsaken, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, smitten, afflicted, pierced through, crushed, chastening and scourging, oppressed and cut off in life, in death, in body, in soul, from man and from God. Meanwhile, verses 4 and 6 answers the question, what was he doing for them and for us? What was he doing? Notice again the plural possessive pronouns. Surely he has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the chast chastisement of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. For what? For what? Sin? Hours, 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 sinners didn't just die for sin. He died for sinners. Our transgressions, our impurity, our iniquities. And to name some, to name some, 
immorality, impurity, sensuality, fornication, evil desires, homosexuality, evil thoughts, adulteries, wickedness, idolatry, sorceries, witchcraft, strife, enmity, outbursts of anger, dispute, dissension, factions, revilers, rebellious, insubordination, envy, jealousy, drunkenness, carousing, greediness, theft, murder, deeds of coveting, slander, blasphemies, gossip, pride, arrogance, self-righteousness, cowardly, and lying. This is us. That's us. I could literally, except for a couple, I could initial my name under every one of these. That's us. Listen, we can't look at sin and, and say, oh, it's my bad. It's not Bad is not bad enough. And bad is not dead enough for what Christ did for us. The chastising, the scourging, the piercing, the crushing, it's not for broken people. Broken people are fixable people, but it's for dead people, damned people, for guilt, for shame. It's not just because... You're broken, I'm broken, the American people is broken, our relationships are broken. Broken is not enough. It downplays what Christ did on the cross. It's missing the mark. It's, it's coming short. It's lawlessness. It's treason. It's rebellion against our Lord, our God, our Maker, our Savior. It's disobedience. It's guilt. Three verbs, three verbs describe he himself bore, he carried, fell upon him. What biblical theologians call vicarious substitution. In his, in his crucifixion and death, he became the very human sewer, the dumping ground. Paul says, he who knew no sin became sin. He made him he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, to be our very own dumping ground, if you will, deep into the heart of a perfect Savior. All the while, verse 6 explains, what were we doing? <laughs> All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Sheeps do what sheeps do. What do sheeps do? They wander off to their own loss, danger, and death. Notice what he says. Each of us has turned to his own way. All of us collectively as a herd, societally, each of us individually. What, what, what modern day sociologists kind of celebrate as expressive individualism, we celebrate self-autonomy and we call it freedom. The more we wander off the path of righteousness, the more we lose ourselves. The more we feed on ourselves, the more the hungrier we seem to get. Always wondering, always looking for meaning, for life, for purpose, feeding, and consuming, and thus consumerism is what's in front of us, trying everything to be fulfilled, gone our own way, trying to find our lost selves, and we keep losing ourselves collectively and individually. Oh, the pride, the pride of this expressive individualism from the youth all the way to the adult. Is, uh, you guys are aware of this, this, this phenomena of selfies. Not poking fun here. 30 years ago, you wouldn't find people holding up camera with a wide lens taking selfies. We would laugh at them. 93 million selfies are taken a day. 93 million since 2014. So bad, over 250 people have died taking selfies of themselves. Some of the captioning, if, if anything tells, says anything about us, here's some of the selfie quotes. Sending my selfie to NASA because I'm a star. I was born to stand out. 
Even in our funerals, the number one requested song in funerals today is My Way by Frank Sinatra. That's us. That's us. Interesting fact about Isaiah 53. The only extended picture metaphor in this chapter is that of a sheep and a lamb. One is driven by his own self-will, self-doing, self-desire, thus killing self-fulfillment, thus killing himself. The other, in the next verse, verse 7, is led to be the sacrifice for others. One is the story of man, and the other is the story of a redeemer. Two sheep, two lambs. Verse 7 and 9, answers the question, how did he behave? How did he behave for God and for us? Look at verse 6, 7 through 9, describes his procession. Verse 8, his execution. Verse 9, his burial. Look at his procession. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet we did not open he did not open his mouth like a lamb that, that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearer. He went out quietly. He went out submissively, even in the midst of oppression. He did not go out protesting, arguing, screaming, fighting for his right, fighting for justice. He went out quiet. He went out with love. I love that verse for, for, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame. He despised the shame of the cross. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away from one mock trial to another mock trial. There is, back in John 18 and 19, there are three interesting phrases talking about this procession that started on Thursday night. Right after the high priestly prayer, the Passover and the high priestly prayer, John 18, 4, 18 1 says, and he went forth, the phrase, he went forth to, to a garden that was nearby. That was Gethsemane. Literally, it means the pressing of the oil. He went out. Somebody said before Jesus was crucified bodily at Golgotha, his spirit was already crucified in Gethsemane. So much so he couldn't wear, bear the burden of the cup and, and fell on his knees and, 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 and sweat, blood-like sweat. He's done with that in the, in the loneliness and in the quietness in the moment. John 18, 4, it says, he went forth again to be falsely betrayed with a friend's kiss, arrested, led to his own trial, Falsely tried, falsely accused, insulted, whipped, beaten. And at the time of the cross, John 19, 17, it says, he went out. So twice he went forth, he went forth, and he went out. That was his procession. That was his procession. Both human and divine judgment fell upon him. I love Anselm. He says this, our debt was so great that while man alone owed it, only God could pay it. One more. Verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. It is in the passive tense, meaning he allowed himself to be afflicted. And so when John 18 and 19 says, He went out, he went out and he went forth, is so that we could come in. Is so that we could come in. Verse 8 describes his execution. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. This was a man at his best by false accusations, testimonies, religious, maneuvering, money, silver, power, politics, all played their role. This is us. This is us. And to add insult to agony, and for his own generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living 
for the transgression of my people. To whom was the stroke was due? Cut off means his life was taken away. His life was snuffed. Who would plead his innocence? The rabbis, the scribes, Pilate, his disciples who scattered on that dreadful evening, Friday evening. As each went to his own home, the Roman soldiers went home and cleaned off and washed off the crusty dirt and the crusty blood off their hands and held up their kids and played with their kids. As the Jews prepared for the celebration of the Passover, the power of God revealed in weakness and in humiliation and in suffering. Who considered? Very few. Very few. Verse 9, his burial. His grave was assigned with the wicked men. He died with criminals and as a criminal, and even worse, he died as a blasphemer. Not only did he enter our agony and bore our sin, but he entered our death and allowed himself the disgrace of fallen man, death, to come upon him. Right here in verse 9, right in the middle of this verse, there is a turning point. There's a turning point. It says, yet he was with, his, with the rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. In his death, the father began to honor him. Because of his innocence, this begins the first step and the hints of the exaltation of the servant, which brings us to the very end of this confession, verses 1 through 9 and verses 10 to 12, the attention all of a sudden turns from the people to the father. And it's the father's testimony that will begin here. Look at verses 10 and 11. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, not his body, his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. So the last question and really the most important question for us, how could the Lord look at this? Look at his son, look at his servant, look at his abed, look at his beloved who grew up before him, who communed for eternity. How could he look and be pleased and be satisfied? Was this, was this some sick child abuse of, of any kind? Of course not. Of course not. The primary purpose of this passage is not the cross. It's the agony of the cross. But what the will of the Lord is, is what the cross brings is the will of God. First, the Lord is an emphatic here. It's no other but the Lord here. Man did his worst he could do to physically beat him, slap him and pluck his beard and whip him. But God was at his best. He was pleased and satisfied. Listen, not for the physical pain, but the purpose of the cross. For the purpose of the cross. God takes, look at, God takes no pleasure in the, in the death of the wicked. He will not take any pleasure in the death of his righteous one. But his purpose was the cross because he will see his seed and he will look and he will rejoice. It is the outcome of the son. In that hour, the father was satisfied. Again, not in the physical agony, but in the atonement itself. And here's the reason. The guilt offering in the Old Testament, it was the most special, most important offering. It was the offering of the whole animal on the altar. It was the offering of the whole animal on the altar. And Jesus said, no one takes my life. I will lay it down. We, the redeemed, we redeemed of the redeemed will never get over that. Listen, on the other side, in Revelation 5, when we sing, when they sing a new song, worthy are you to take a, the book and to break its seal, and you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe, tongue, people, 
a nation. That passage came home to me this afternoon. I had lunch with a, with a former Shiite Muslim brother. This man grew up in Iran. They would beat themselves for Muhammad. This has been brewing in my heart. I asked him, I said, what did, you, what did the death of Christ mean to you? He said, I saw the passion of Christ as a Muslim, and I came out cursing and hating the people who were killing him. He said, I went to critique. He said, then I saw it as a believer. And he said, he said, to understand what Christ did for me came into my heart and into my gut like a sword, like fire. He goes, I wept. And he said, in a very, very dynamic way, the Lord brought, brought it to my heart. Muhammad, it is for you that I'm on the cross. He goes, it burned in my bosom. He said, Pastor, I can't get over it. I can't get over it. And in heaven, and thousands of years later, heaven won't get over it. Don't we dare ever get over this. Well, verse 11 and 12. The father opens and closes, my servant, my abed. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, and he will, see, he will bear their iniquities because he poured himself out to death. He will see it and he will be satisfied by his knowledge. We, we, he will justify the many. And there's always a ther therefore for Ken. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong. This is language of a victor a conquering king with the reward. The language of a high priestly prayer, Jesus four times in John 17 says this, they were yours and you gave them to me. They were yours and you gave them to me. And here he dies for them. The gift of God, you and me, every redeemed soul, the gift of the Father to the Son, the Son says, I will die. I will die for them. So, What's beautiful is, back to the first question, as we close this, who would have believed our message? The arm of the Lord is triumphant in his servant. Who would have believed it? Only those, only those who will see it and enter it and apply it by faith will be saved. Psalm 49, 7 says, no man can by any means redeem his own brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly. It is costly. I love this. I, this passage has meant so much. Spurgeon says, To ever deny the great doctrine of the atonement by the blood of Jesus Christ is to cut the throat of of Christianity. We can't get over this. Not in our lives, not in the gospel, and not in the preaching. So tonight as we close and as we pray and we get ready for the celebrating the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, as we commemorate and, and remember what He has done. And when He lifts up that cup and He says, this is my blood of the new covenant, I hope we come to that in a very endearing, deep, special way. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for, for Isaiah 53. Thank you for the goodness that you have shown us on this Good Friday to meditate and to remember the servant of the Lord. Father, Please, I beg you tonight, make this weekend. I know that I know that I know Sunday is on the way. Lord, in that hope, in that hope of the resurrection, we celebrate and we remember this God's Friday, the Good Friday. 
We thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our life. Amen. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.